Good morning. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Rajini Shivram, and this is a 60-minute presentation on reactive Kafka. This is the safe harbor statement from Pipatrol. I'm not going to read it out, but the code that we are discussing today has not yet been released. There are no release dates yet. So we are sharing the results of our initial investigations into reactive Kafka with you. A little bit about me. I'm a software engineer at Pivotal in UK, in Southampton. I joined Pivotal recently in April. Previously, I was at IBM. I was a software engineer working on IBM Message Hub, which is uh, Kafka as a service on IBM Bluemix. My main focus as in Message Hub was to develop the security and multi-tenancy features which enable Kafka to be run as a service on Bluemix. I have also worked on several other messaging systems, WebSphere MQ, um, WebSphere platform messaging, real-time messaging, etc. I've been a contributor to Apache Kafka for the last couple of years, and I'm continuing to do that as well. This talk will be in two parts. The first half will be an introduction to Kafka, and we'll look at the clients and tools around Kafka. We'll go a little bit deep into the non-reactive Java clients, because the reactive API is built on top of that. We'll have a quick introduction to reactive streams, and following that, we will take a look at the reactive Kafka, the Kafka API, as well as the, uh, with some samples and examples. And finally, we'll share the evaluation of performance comparing reactive and non-reactive APIs with you. So we'll start with what is Kafka. Can we have a quick show of hands as to who has used Kafka before? So quite a few of you. So some of this may be repetitive, but I will, for the others who haven't used, I'll just give a quick overview of what Kafka is and how it differs from other messaging systems. So those of you who have used messaging systems will recognize Kafka immediately as a pub sub message bus. It is fast, so latencies of two to three milliseconds are quite common with typical loads on Kafka. It is scalable. If you want to increase throughput, you can uh, simply add more brokers, and um, you would increase the throughput. And you can also bring down brokers, so it's actually elastically scalable. So if you're running applications on the cloud, Kafka is quite a good uh, message bus to run on the cloud. It's durable. So messages are persisted on disk. But the, we'll let, look at later how durability in Kafka differs from that of other messaging systems. It is highly available. Um, in traditional messaging systems, when you build high availability, typically you have a monolithic broker. And when you're building high availability, you have another broker by the side. In Kafka, high availability is very much built into the design of Kafka. So we will see what that means. If you're a data-centric person building a data pipeline, a different way of looking at Kafka is as a commit log service. Kafka is a distributed collection of logs. They're replicated for high availability, and we'll look at that image also later on. So this is Kafka as a message bus. And most of you will recognize this picture. This picture came straight out of the uh, Kafka documentation. It also, you can replace Kafka cluster in the middle with any message broker, like RabbitMQ. And what you have is a broker that decouples producers and consumers. The difference between Kafka and other messaging systems is that Kafka stores messages for a configurable period of time. Typically, in traditional messaging systems, you would store messages, brokers store messages on behalf of consumers. Once the consumers have consumed the messages, then the broker discards the messages. In Kafka, you typically configure a retention interval. By default, it's seven days. And you keep the messages for seven days, regardless of whether they have been consumed or not. This opens up quite a, new, a, a lot of new possibilities for Kafka. Consumers can come along at any time and replay the message stream. For instance, if you want to do analytics, you can set up uh, um, batch processes which run at night, replay the messages. Consumers also, because they're consuming from logs sequentially, it gives you efficient consumers which add very little load on the broker. This is a different view of Kafka as a commit log service. It's a collection of um, uh, log files. Like in traditional messaging system, the message feed is called a topic. But the topic is divided into partitions. The um, partitions are immutable, immutable ordered streams. So the unit of ordering is partitions. Topics are partially ordered. 
top um, partitions are also the unit of scalability. So if you are, uh, if you want to scale Kafka, you would add more partitions, and you'd have, uh, you can host those partitions on more brokers. It's also the unit of parallelisms, not just on the broker, but also on the consumer side. So you would have partitions which are, um, uh, consumers get allocated partitions. So if you want to do load balancing and add more consumers, you would need more partitions to, cons to consume. So it's a distributed collection of locks, as you can see. You've got um, locks on various brokers. It's also replicated for high availability. So you've got one, uh, one of the brokers is designated the leader for each partition. And uh, the producers and consumers produce and consume from the leader. The other partitions, they're followers, and they try to keep up with the leader. So if one of the nodes fails, you always have copies of the data. This is the message format in Kafka. If you're used to um, more traditional messaging systems like AMQP or JMS, you'll find that this is actually a very basic message format. So it's got a fixed size header and a key and value, which as far as Kafka is concerned is just an opaque array of bytes. The producers and consumers can add structure to this data by providing serializers and deserializers. The key is used typically to root messages to partitions. So if you are, for instance, storing sensor data, you can specify that the key is the name or ID of the sensor, so that all the messages corresponding to one sensor would go to a single partition. If you want to add more headers, like in AMQP, you would store those in the payload and provide serializers and deserializers which interpret those headers. So this is a more detailed view of the topic. So the topic is a collection of partitions, and you append messages to the end of the partition. And there's a, there's a logical offset for each message, so it's a monotonically increasing sequence of numbers. The triplet topic partition and offset uniquely identifies each message in your cluster. On disk, you have a directory for uh, one or more directories for storing the logs, and for each partition that is hosted on each broker, you'll find a log file and also an index file, which gives a mapping between the logical offset and the physical file offset, so that you can seek to the message that you want to start consuming from. You may have multiple log files, so the logs may be divided into log segments. So when your retention period interval, uh, retention interval um, elapses, the old log, uh, log segment files can be deleted. You also have some checkpoint files which allow Kafka to get your broker back into a consistent state if one of the brokers crashes. Logs can also be compacted, so by default, when you, the retention period intervals, you delete, you delete the logs, but you can also specify that you want compacted logs where only the latest uh, the, the latest message corresponding to each key is retained. So for instance, if you're looking at share prices, you might only be interested in the latest value. You're not interested in the old values. So you can tell Kafka that you want the logs to, to retain the latest value and delete all the older values. So this is putting it all together. So that's the Kafka cluster. In Kafka, you typically have a local disk because uh, disk performance is critical. So you have a collection of logs. Zookeeper provides the functionality for distributed consensus. So it helps you elect leaders for partitions and also stores all the consistent metadata for uh, Kafka. Kafka is a system that is uh, built for operational maintenance. It generates quite a lot of uh, a really comprehensive set of metrics. And you can easily connect up uh, um, Grafana or any uh, tool that uh, displays metrics to get fancy graphs, but you can also connect to pages to be so that you can get alerted when things go wrong. So let's see what happens when you want to transmit a message. So this is the picture, this is the picture that you've seen before. You've got a topic with a collection of partitions hosted on a set of brokers. I have a producer with a message. Producer sends the message to the leader and the followers, they are constantly asking the leader for messages. So the followers try to catch up with the leader by pulling the messages from the leader. So once the message is got up to all the replicas, the uh, message is considered committed. So if the producer wants an acknowledgment of committed messages, it is at this point that the, produ the producer gets the acknowledgment. 
The difference between Kafka and traditional messaging systems is that at the time a message is committed, the message might not actually have been persisted to disk on any of the machines. All it means is that it's got, you've got three copies of it on three brokers. It may still be sitting in disk buffers. And this contributes to the low latencies that you see in Kafka. Kafka also has the concept of in-sync replicas. So the replicas which are keeping up with the leader, they're called in-sync replicas. This means if one of the brokers dies, one of the followers dies, and or is just slow catching up, then you're not holding up the producers. Competent messages are delivered to consumers, which are again polling from the leader. So consumers in Kafka are very, um, very cheap because they're very efficient. The messages which are delivered to consumers, they're delivered using zero copyrights. So instead of taking the message from the disk, copying it into the broker's address space, and then copying it back from broker to the kernel address space for sending over the socket, it can bypass that and just send directly from the disk buffer to the socket buffer. So this avoids two uh, context switches and copies. So it is essentially have very efficient consumers which add very little load on the brokers. Also because you're consuming sequentially from disk, consumers tend to be very cheap. Let's look at what happens if one of the brokers dies. So Kafka implements high availability. So if one of the brokers dies, the, it's a, the, uh, each broker has a session with Zookeeper and the session expires when one of the brokers dies. So typically, you'd have a session in a timeout of uh, five or six milliseconds, or five or six seconds, so you would notice that the failure has occurred. So once, a, when, when your session expires, Zookeeper knows that your broker has gone away. We have not met the controller yet. Controller is one of the brokers which is responsible for maintaining the state of all of the partitions in your entire cluster. So the controller is watching Zookeeper, so when a broker dies, the controller notices that um, a broker has gone away, and it, need, it also knows which partitions are hosted on that broker. So at this point, the controller, decide, uh, controller needs to move the uh, partition, which has got broker five as the leader, and move it to one of the in-sync replicas, and elect that as the new leader. So the leader moves to one of the in-sync replicas, and the producers and consumers can continue to produce and consume without any downtime. This higher availability also enables you to do rolling upgrades. For instance, if you had a security upgrade, you could take one broker down. The, uh, they'll be rebalancing, the controller will do the rebalancing for you automatically. You can upgrade your broker and put, uh, bring back the new broker again. When the, new bro when the broker comes back up, at that point, if the broker had crashed, you may want to, it will, you will want to restore it to a consistent state. So the checkpoint files will be used to perhaps uh, truncate the logs to get it back into a consistent state. But if you do a, a, a graceful shutdown, then everything will be consistent and you can, uh, the broker will be back operational immediately. So once the broker is back up, the first thing it does is it's, it's got a replica, so it will try to catch up with the new leader because messages may have been published when the broker was down. Once it's caught up, the controller, when it does its new rebalancing, it will replace the, it will elect new leaders so that the, the leaders are all balanced across the cluster. The guarantees that Kafka provides, uh, the message ordering is by partition, not by topic. All the messages sent by producer to a particular partition are appended to the log in that order. So this is similar to the, it, like for instance in JMS, the guarantee that you get for topics, but in Kafka you get it per partition. The consumer instances, they see the messages in the order that are stored in the log. So all consumer instances would see messages for each partition in the same order that they were published. Delivery semantics, by default with Kafka you get at least once delivery, so you may see duplicates but you never lose a message. You can also implement at most once delivery if you like, uh, on top of this where you never get a duplicate but you may lose messages. Exactly once it's not delivered, in, uh, it's not implemented in Kafka, it's not currently supported. You can implement it along with external uh, um, tools and there are discussions on improving this in Kafka. There's a whole set of con configuration parameters that come. How 
So if you, uh, the question is how do you implement exactly once? And if you wanted to do ex exactly once delivery now, you would have to connect it up to a um, transactional system and uh, store your offsets uh, uh, yourself so that you can keep track of it. Kafka itself doesn't implement exactly once. So the broker gives you parameters which, de uh, which tell you, uh, which where you can tell the broker how much this space you are allowed to use, uh, what type of high availability parameters that you want, especially when you have trade-offs to make. So for instance, replica lag time decides whether uh, how you decide when a replica is an ISR or not. Our unclean leader election decides whether as a last resort you should be allowed to take a replica which is not uh, caught up with the leader and make it the new leader if there are no other options available. You can have a, a specifier a broker rack so that uh, you can have rack of a replication, uh, uh, assignment of replicas. So if an uh, entire rack went down or you switched it off by mistake, you don't lose all of the data corresponding to any partition. The broker configuration properties are static, so if you want to change the properties, you actually have to restart the broker. You can also have per topic configuration parameters. Most of these have defaults in the broker, but you can specify these per topic. For instance, cleanup policy to decide whether a topic should be compacted or deleted. The parameters for retention, like the amount of time or the amount of disk space a topic is allowed to have. And um, minimum number of in-sync replicas. For security, Kafka does give you a lot of um, security features like encryption. So you can have, you can specify that you want encryption on the client side or if you wanted encryption even for interbroker communication. You can also have um, authentication based on certificates or curb ROS or just use an M password. You can also put, if you if you're need real, even more security, you can put a proxy in the middle to create a demilitarized zone so that you have separate SSL stacks, which makes the system even more secure. You, also, you can also specify access control and quotas, which if, uh, prevent clients from hogging the network. All of these features will be available for the reactive clients as well. The use cases for Kafka, Kafka is a good uh, it's a good messaging service for uh, for running on the cloud because it's elastically scalable. It's got all the high availability features. It is a good example of a service that can be used to build microservice uh, applications using the microservice architecture because it gives you messaging using very, with very low latencies. It, it can be used as a commit log. It can be used for stream processing. In the Kafka documentation, there's quite a, a few examples of um, uh, scenarios where Kafka is useful. And there are also lots of blogs on how to use Kafka in different scenarios. So that was a, a tour of Kafka. And we'll now look at um, existing tools and clients around Kafka so that we can understand where um, the reactive API actually fits and whether is there really a need for reactive API. And if there is, uh, where does it fit? So this, these are some of the clients that come with Kafka. There are quite a lot more. There's a Java producer and consumer that ship with, ship with Kafka. And apart from that, there are producers and consumers for various different languages. There's also Kafka Connect, which allows you to connect Kafka to different external systems, like databases, for instance. You can pull data from databases and or push data into other systems. Kafka Streams, which allows stream processing, and there's a large ecosystem of other tools and uh, clients around Kafka, like Spark and Storm. Most of these tools work very well without back pressure, so that's another reason why we want to understand whether if we had reactive API, what value does it add to this vast collection of tools? We will look at the Java producer and consumer in some detail because this is the reactive API is built on top of that. So when you, this is an example of a producer. So when you want to create a producer, you give it some properties, for instance, where your broker, where your cluster is, and you create a producer. Typically, you would have one producer in, in your entire JVM, and you would share the producer. It's, some, it's a thread safe producer. By sharing a producer in your entire JVM, you actually do get efficiencies. So I've got, got a very simple program, for loop, which sends a set of messages. When you do a send, you get back a future. It's an asynchronous send. So if you wanted to wait for the message to be sent, you can do a get on the future. But I want to do an asynchronous send with a callback, so you get notified when the send completes. 
So the callback tells you uh, when uh, either that an exception occurred or if the message was sent successfully. So let's see what, ha uh, so that was the Java uh, 7 code and this is a Java 8 code, which is slightly neater, but you still have a callback to deal with. So let's see what happens when you send a message through Kafka. So in, when, when you send the message, the first thing that the producer needs to do is to determine the partition that the message should be sent to. So it, you can specify that I want to send this message to partition three, topic A, but you can also say that choose a partition for me. And if you do that, the producer would choose a partition based on the key in, your, uh, in the message so that all the messages corresponding to a key goes to the same partition. And if you don't have a key, it would just be round robin. So once you have the partition, you need to find out who the leader of the partition is so that the message can be sent to the leader. So the producer uh, adds the topic to the metadata and waits for the metadata. There's a background thread which does the actual communication with the broker. So it makes sure that if you have one, it, the, the, you make as few connections as possible to your cluster. So you start off with a bootstrap broker and ask it who's the leader of my partition. So when you got the, when you, once you found the leader, the producer adds the message to a local queue, and at this point, it is returned. It, so it's an asynchronous send, and when the send returns, you've just put the message in a local queue within your JVM. It hasn't actually gone anywhere. At some point later, you may be doing batching, so the network thread might wait for more messages to arrive, or you can send it immediately if you want as well. So at some point, the message gets sent to the leader. If you're waiting for acknowledgement, you'd wait until the replicas have fetched the message from the uh, leader, and then the response is sent back to the producer. The response arrives on the producer network thread, and you see the callback saying that you've got the, uh, um, the message has been delivered. And at that point, the uh, so I had a log statement saying on the, in the callback saying I want to print out the uh, metadata that was received. So the demo topic there, that's the topic that I sent the message to. Two is the partition that it was sent to, and 62 is the offset where it was written. So we can take a look at this. So this is the sample producer, that the code that you just looked at. So I've got a consumer running, and I've got Kafka running as well. So if I run this code, hopefully, So I'm running the producer, and you can see on the console consumer that the messages were received. And you can see that the messages are not in the order at 0 to uh, ten, uh, uh, 9. They are actually mixed up, and that's because the ordering is per partition. If you look at the, the output, you can see that within a topic, uh, within a partition, the offsets are sequential, but across the partitions, it, there is no ordering. You can also see that the callbacks arrived on the network thread. So if you were to do, uh, if you wanted to do more complex operations when a callback arrives, then you wouldn't want to do it on the network thread because you don't want to block the network thread, which may be used, uh, which is used for um, other operations as well. So you, if you are in this case, because I'm just printing it out, the, the network thread should be okay. Like with other uh, entities in Kafka, producers also have a large number of configuration parameters. So uh, one of them is, uh, uh, for instance, the buffer memory, it is, uh, it is specify how much buffer you are allowed to use in the producer, how, how long should you block if there isn't enough memory, that are those types of parameters. And also, uh, whether you, how many in-flight requests should, uh, should be allowed. If you're, the default number of in-flight requests is five, which means that message may get reordered when there are retries. You can set it to one, but the trade-off is you would lose performance. You can also specify the parameters for batching. With batching, you um, get higher throughput, but then the latency also goes up. So that was a producer. We'll take a look at the non-reactive uh, Kafka consumer. In traditional messaging systems, there are typically two messaging models. There's the publish-subscribe, where you're broadcasting a message to multiple consumers and point-to-point -point or queues where you send a message to a queue and only one of the consumers receives the message. And Kafka uses the concept of consumer groups where um, each group receives the uh, all the messages. So you can implement publish subscribe on top of consumer groups by putting each consumer in its own group. You can guarantee that every consumer gets every message. You could do point-to-point -point also with consumer groups by putting all of your consumers in one group. So you. Uh, 
each only one consumer in your group receives each message. But you can also have combinations where, it, like in this case, consumer group A and consumer group B both receive all messages. When you're consuming from Kafka with uh, in traditional messaging system, you have a choice between push-based uh, consuming and pull-based. In push-based systems, when a, bro a message arrives at the broker, it is immediately sent to the consumers who are listening for it. The problem with this is that if the consumer is not ready to process the message, then you need to buffer the message, and then what happens when there's a buffer overflow? So some systems deal with this by using a pull-based consumer. So when a message arrives at the broker, the broker doesn't send it off immediately to the consumer it would wait for the consumer to be ready to pull the message. The it, problem with this is that if the, the consumer needs to know when a message has arrived, so it has to keep polling the broker. So you could end up in a tight loop polling the broker, and that could add load on the broker. Kafka uses pull-based uh, consume, but it uses a long poll. When you do a pull, you can specify how long you're willing to wait for the message. So you see the, you, the broker sends the response either when it times out or when there's enough data available to send. So this solves the problem of buffer overflow that with the push-based system as well as the tight loop with the pull-based system. Kafka can do offset management. So if you want Kafka to store offsets, Kafka would store it for you in an internal topic. So it's, this is a compacted topic where the latest offset is stored and the older offsets can be discarded. So you can specify auto commit where uh, periodically Kafka stores the offsets of the messages that, ha that have been delivered, or manual commit where you decide when you want to commit the offsets. You can also use an external system for offset management. So let's look at a, a consumer example. So you do a subscribe, and when you do a subscribe, you can specify a rebalance listener. This tells you when partitions are assigned to you, and also when partitions are taken away from you, revoked. On assigned is typically used to um, seek to the offset that you want to start consuming from when uh, partitions are assigned. And on revoked is used to commit your offsets when uh, b just before partitions are taken away from you. So this is a while loop to match the for loop that we use for the send. So you, in a consumer, you would poll for messages. So in this, way, in this case, you're saying you poll, you want, you're willing to wait for one second. And then it, you get, uh, if there are messages available, you get the list of mes a set of messages. And in this case, I'm just printing it out. Shall we look at when it's invoked? And then, so the question is, uh, should the consumer implement on assigned and on revoked and when. and when yes we look at the picture the sequence diagram and i can tell you uh, when it is called and also whether you need to uh, specify an override so let's look at what happens when a consumer is uh, when you subscribe and poll so when you do a subscribe you specify a list of topics or a regular expression that you want to subscribe from and at that point, it, the subscription is created, but nothing else happens. And when you do the poll, that's when things actually start happening. So when, when you're first polling, the, no, uh, nothing has been assigned to you, but you have a subscription. At that point, the, f the first thing you need to do is to find, you need to find the topic metadata just like a producer because you need the leader of the partition, but you also need to find the group coordinator. So one of the brokers is designated the group coordinator for every, um, for every consumer group. So it's the consumer uh, uh, the group coordinator who's responsible for managing the life cycle of the consumers in the group. So uh, before joining the group, you, uh, the on partition revoke, uh, so when you do a rebalance, right at the start of the rebalance, the on partitions revoked callback is invoked. That is so that if your consumer is already in the group, you get a chance to commit your offsets if you're doing manual commits. So that is, and so if, you, if you're doing automatic commits, then you don't need to implement the on revoked. It's only if you wanted to complete your processing and then commit your offsets, then at that point, then you can specify the actions that you want to take. 
uh, notice that for rebalance, it's not just the new consumer which is taking part in the rebalance. Every consumer in the consumer group needs to take part in the rebalance because it's, uh, it is possible that other consumers are already. Sorry, go ahead. So, uh, uh, the, so the question is, does the group coordinator wait until all of the on revoked complete before it does the rebalancing? The, the, there is a session timeout. That, uh, so if your consumer never does a join, then it would not, be, would not join. But before it jo does the join group there, it, does the, uh, it completes the, on, uh, the revoked. So you have a timeout. Which, you, which tells you how long you have before you take part in the rebalance. And you have to take part in the rebalance in order to continue to be in the group. So, okay, so the, once the rebalance has occurred, you get your unassigned, part, uh, the unassigned callback. So the unassigned callback tells you which partitions are, have been assigned to you. At this point, if you're interested in seeking then you do need to implement the on-assigned callback. But if, you, if you're just continuing to consume from the latest offset, that, uh, and you, you don't really, then you don't need to have a callback. So you can just create a subscriber without a callback if you don't, need, if you don't have any operations to do on the on-revoked or uh, on-assigned. Does that answer your question? It's nearly added in nine. So the new consumer was added in nine. So the consumer that we're looking at is the new consumer in nine. So in the older consumers and uh, the uh, older versions, they had the simple consumer and the high-level consumer, and the offsets were stored in Zookeeper, and there was no, uh, it was done in a very different way. So notice also that there is a client-side coordinator. The actual assignment of partitions is done by the client-side coordinator. One of the nice things about having assignment on the client-side coordinator is that you can ha the clients can define their own assignment strategies without actually changing the broker. So once you've got the, uh, your partition, the next thing is you need to do is to find out where you, where you want to start consuming from. So basically, the latest offsets stored in uh, the consumer offsets topic. So you fetch the offsets from, and once you fetch the offsets, now you can go into a loop and start fetching all the messages. So, uh, so you do a fetch, you get back some messages, and then just before you return the messages to your consumer, you trigger off the next prefetch so that uh, new messages will be waiting for you when you do your next poll. So you return the records that you got back, you return to your consumer. And at this point, I had a while loop which was printing out the messages, so I got some messages. And then once you process the message, you go back into your poll. So the uh, typical consumer uh, looks like a poll followed by process the messages followed by a poll. When you do a poll, you also, the Kafka client also takes care of hard meeting for you. So you do need to do regular hard meeting in order to keep your consumer alive. Uh, in, so at the moment, if you take too long to process your messages, you could in, in your loop, you might miss your heartbeat, and that could potentially mean you're thrown out of the group. So there is work going on to do heartbeating in the background so that th that behavior is improved. So let's take a look at what happens when we run the consumer. So this is the non-reactive consumer. So as you can see, the consumer was created. Those are the properties of the consumer. And on a single thread, because it's just doing the poll, you can see the messages which were received. Notice also that even though those messages were received earlier in the console consumer, you're still seeing the messages in the new consumer, in the consumer that was just run. That's because they belong to different consumer groups. So consumers also have quite a lot of properties associated with them, include, which dictate how much um, memory can be used on the consumer, as well as how long it's willing to wait, and so on. And the timeouts, which this is a session timeout, which is used for, uh, to detect instance failures and to do rebalancing. There's the heartbeat interval, which uh, it says how, long, how often the consumer heartbeats. So that was the uh, Java consumer.
it, apart from that, there are some tools which ship with Kafka. Kafka Connect is used to uh, take messages from external data sources or to uh, transmit messages into external data things. So if you were wanted to build an ETL pipeline, for instance, you can take data from an SQL database and store it into Hadoop using the connector. You also have streams for uh, stream processing. So the Kafka streams allows you to take messages from Kafka have a, a lot of stream operators. You can define complex processor topologies and uh, store the results back into Kafka. Streams uses a very simple threading model. It is reactive. It is not reactive, but it doesn't actually require back pressure because the message is a pull from Kafka. You do some processing and then store the results back into the uh, back into Kafka. So that was a quick introduction to uh, Kafka and the clients around Kafka. We'll now take a look at reactive streams. So I won't go into detail of reactive streams because um, most of you would have gone to the presentations, hopefully, from yesterday and day before. And if you haven't, please do watch the videos because they do give quite a good introduction. So reactive streams is a fundamental shift from imperative style programming to functional style programming. And in particular, it helps simplifies the development of asynchronous uh, uh, code, which requires asynchronous um, interactions. It serves more heterogeneous requests concurrently. It improves the, uh, the utilization of resources when you are doing asynchronous operations. It gives you a functional composable API. It also gives you end-to-end um, non-blocking back pressure. So data is fetched only when the consumers are ready to fetch the data, the, which means that you are able to control the total amount of data in flight in your pipeline. So this picture hopefully is familiar to you from yesterday. So it, these are the two, ob the two main subscribing objects in Project Reactor. You've got the flux, which is a sequence of events, uh, which could be non-terminating, and a mono, which is one, a zero or one event. Uh, we will look at this in the context of Kafka later. This is also a picture which hopefully you remember from yesterday. When you're building microservices and you want to have end-to-end -end flow control, Reactive helps to implement the flow control, um, non-blocking flow control end-to-end. -end. Please do see Stefan and Rosen's presentation from where this came from. So we'll now we'll look at Reactive Kafka, the API. So Reactive Kafka aims to bring the power of Reactive Streams into Kafka. It is a functional style Reactive API with, um, which, with uh, non-blocking back pressure if you're building a pipeline. It's a composable side of a free API. As an implementation, it's just a thin shim over the non-reactive Java API. That's the reason we are looking at the Java API in so much detail. So at the API level, we have two main objects, Kafka Sender for me outgoing messages going into, uh, going into Kafka, and um, for the incoming side, you have a Kafka flux, which is a sequence of messages received from Kafka. So it's a non-terminating flux, which just keeps reading from Kafka. So in the Kafka Sender, there's a create method to create the sender. So like with the non-reactive producer, you would create one Kafka Sender and use it in your entire application. It, 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 so you'd have one send up in the JVM. And when you do a send, you get back a mono, which it completes when your send has been acknowledged. Notice that there is no future now. Instead, you have a mono, and there is no callback. So the mono can take use all the operators that are available to uh, that, are, uh, that Project Reactor implements. On the incoming side, you have Kafka Flux. So you specify that you, which topics you want to listen on. It, provide some uh, configuration parameters, and you get back a flux, which is a sequence of messages. One of the differences between normal Kafka and um, the, the reactive one is that you specify acknowledgment modes. You have slightly different set of acknowledgment modes because the messages are being delivered to you rather than you pulling them. These acknowledgments, uh, acknowledgment modes are um, consistent with Spring Kafka integration because it's the use case is more similar to Spring than to uh, the, uh, the non-reactive Kafka API. So you can have manual commit where you, are con where you have full control over when you commit messages, but you can also specify manual acknowledgment where you acknowledge when you finish processing the message, but the reactive layer will take care of um, committing the messages for you. For instance, you can say, I want to commit every five messages, or I want to commit every 10 seconds. 
You can also have at most once where the messages are committed before they're delivered to you, so you never see duplicates. And the default is auto hack, where the messages are committed based on the uh, commit parameters that you've specified automatically. So let's look at an example. So you create a producer, a, a Kafka sender with some configuration parameters. Can you repeat the question, please? So you said the, the difference between the Kafka, reactive Kafka API and a regular Kafka API is that messages are delivered to the listener for that rather than having to call for that. So uh, how is that internally implemented? Are you calling internally still or something? Okay, the question is. I, if in reactive stuff, messages are delivered to you using a flux, while in non-reactive, you pull the messages using polling, so you want to know how the polling is, uh, uh, how does it work in internally. So we will take a look at the picture of how uh, the flux is implemented later on. So this is the producer side, so you've created your producer with some parameters, and so we want to implement the same uh, loop as we had in the, react, in the non-reactive case. So instead of a for loop, I have a flux a dot range. I have a set, a set of numbers. I translate those into messages, and then I do the send. I want to collect the results back. I don't really care about the uh, order in which the callbacks were invoked, so I have a flat map which to collect them. And then uh, for each uh, response, I'm just printing out the response. And if there is an error, it prints out an error. Notice that at this point, n nothing has actually happened. So it's, this is declarative. So un until you actually subscribe and make a request, uh, no messages are sent. You haven't made any connections. You haven't even created your Kafka producer. So once you've got your flux, you do a subscribe. This is a subscribe API with an unbounded request. So at this point, you, the requests start going up the chain, and the uh, messages get sent. So if you look at what happens, so this is the declaration that you made. You've got a Kafka flux with some numbers and a flat map operator, and we'll see what happens when the request goes up. So there's an unbounded request, but the flat map makes a request for 256 elements. So one by one, the elements start coming down. So the message gets, it, each number gets converted into a message sent to the broker. Since that returns a mono, and the mono completes when the send acknowledgment is received. And because there is a request, the uh, acknowledgment flows down downstream. So you can see that uh, until the request is made, nothing happens. And as the, once, the, once you have a request, the uh, messages get sent, and you get the responses. Similarly, with the other, num uh, the other messages, they start flowing down. They get sent off to the broker. And when they complete, because it's a flat map, in some order, they start flowing. The uh, monos complete, and you see the events flowing down. And finally, the flux completes. So if you look at what happens when we run this code, so that's the reactive producer, which is sending messages. I've got some log lines there so that you can see what happens. So it, you can see that until the unsubscribe and request is made, nothing happens, and then the cre producer gets created. The, it, the producer gets create, created when the first message is ready to be sent. And thereafter, the other sends happen. And you can notice that all the sends happen on the main thread, but your callbacks, when they come, they, come, they are on a different scheduler. By default, a new scheduler is created to uh, send you, uh, to deliver the callbacks to you. That is so that Kafka, the reactor doesn't take control of the, produ the Kafka producer's network thread, which is doing all the I.O. And for each message, you can see that the um, offsets are being printed. And on the console consumer, which was running previously, you can see that the messages were delivered as well. So that's the log that you, you were just looking at. Just a few of the lines, just to highlight a few things. So until the subscribe happens, uh, there's no producer created. And when there's a request and the very first message is ready to be sent, you see that the Kafka producer is created with some configuration. 
and then the, when the messages do get delivered, they get delivered on a separate scheduler. You can change the schedule on which callbacks are uh, invoked. On the consumer side, you listen on, uh, you specify what you want to listen on, and you can also specify the callbacks for unassigned and, and on revoked. So this is very similar to the um, non-reactive API where you can seek and commit if you, uh, when you're assigned partitions. And then finally, you subscribe. So until you subscribe, nothing happens. But when you do subscribe, I, in this case, it says what you want to do with each message that, it's rece that it receives. So if you look at, this is the internal detail that you were asking for. So internally, uh, we have the, so we need to make sure that all the requests going into the Kafka broker happens on one broker, uh, on a single thread. And to avoid synchronization, we have a list of uh, fluxes which are merged together to form a single flux which sends events to Kafka. So the very first time when you subscribe, you get requests going up, and you have poll events generated at that time. So the, the first poll causes the assign to happen. So the poll event, through the merge, it's coming down to the single flux, which communicates with the Kafka cluster. So the poll event is generated, and at this point, you get assigned partitions. Because there's a st there are still requests pending, you get another poll. And this time, maybe you get some records. So these records are delivered to you as individual, Kafka gives you a collection of records and they're in, uh, delivered to you using concat map as, a, uh, as individual records. Concat map so that the records are given to you in order. So you see a set of records delivered to you. And if you, if you don't poll, the heart beating is also taken care of you in the background by, one, uh, by the periodic flux. So you have periodic fluxes to do commits and heartbeats apart from the poll, which is driven by the requests that, you, that are coming from downstream. So uh, as you uh, process the messages, more requests go up, and you get more uh, polls, and more messages start flowing down. So if we just look at, we'll take a look at the demo. So that's the consume API. So again, you can see until there are requests and subscribes, nothing happens. And when you have a request, the consumer gets uh, created. And on a single thread scheduler, you have all the operations, doing the polls happening there. And that's when your assignment happens. That's where you, the, um, uh, your, the poll happens and the uh, partitions get assigned to you. Messages are delivered on a separate parallel flux by default, but you can change the scheduler if you like. So based on what you intend to do with the data, you can set up your schedulers. So this is just a, a subset of the entries that you saw there. So you got this unsubscribes and the on next on the internal uh, 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 on the internal flux, so there's the init event, which is the very first event, which does the subscribe, followed by poll events, which happen, which do the poll. There's a single thread scheduler for all the interactions with the Kafka consumer, for and a parallel flux for delivering your events to you. So all of the configuration properties with the non-reactive non producers and consumers are available to you, including security and all the buffer management. In addition to that, there are some parameters that you can specify for the, the um, for committing, for instance. You can specify the interval or the batch size at which you want committed. You can also specify how many commit attempts so that you can fail the flux if you don't manage to commit. So that was a look at the API. And we'll now take a look at the, uh, the initial performance evaluation we did comparing reactive and non-reactive. The performance tests were run on Rackspace with a three node cluster. They were all bare metal machines. Each of them had a 1.6 terabyte, dual 1.6 terabyte disk. A three node Zookeeper cluster and three node Kafka cluster. The test driver was also a bare metal machine, a compute node. That's the configuration. 
So this is the raw throughput of the producer. This was run using the standard producer performance test that comes with Kafka. So it's a single thread driving messages as fast as it can through to Kafka. You can see that the higher is better, and you can see that reactive actually performs a lot worse than non-reactive when you're just driving messages using a single thread, especially when message uh, rate is low and you want to drive as many messages as possible. On the right-hand side, actually, it's a log. Um, it, it uses uh, a log for y-axis. That's why it looks closer. But actually, it, you can see that uh, the reactive is never better than non-reactive, and actually, and it can be a lot slower when you have smaller messages. This is the consumer performance. The reactor looks, in, in, again, lower is, uh, higher is better, but reactor looks slightly higher, but that's just a variation in test runs. In reality, it's very, very close. The both reactive and non-reactive perform quite similarly for consumers. The difference in producer and consumer is that in producers, in the uh, producers use a background thread, so the management of the threading when you map it to reactive, you are losing some performance, while in the consumers, because there is no background thread, you are able to get almost the same performance with both reactive and non-reactive. That is the end-to-end -end latency on an idle system, so the 50th percentile and 75th percentile. Again, you can see that the numbers are actually very, very similar for both reactive and non-reactive. So, so the raw performance is interesting, but it doesn't really give you a reason to start using reactive API. It's um, it, at best, it's as good as non-reactive. At worst, it can be a lot worse. It also takes a little bit more work to get the performance out of reactive compared to non-reactive, where you're just using a single thread. So we want to look at an example where there are multiple uh, entities in your pipeline, not just Kafka. So in this example, you're driving messages to Kafka using HTTP. So the comparison is between the Kafka REST proxy that comes, uh, that is uh, Confluence REST proxy, which does HTTP to Kafka, and it's compared with um, Spring Reactive Web, which uh, is a reactive HTTP proxy containing a reactive Kafka client. Both are run on Jetty. Sp uh, Spring Reactive would probably perform a lot better with Netty, but in order to have a fair comparison, we have used Jetty with the same configuration, so unlimited, uh, a thread pool with unlimited number of threads. So we'll take a quick look at the code before we look at the performance numbers. So you may have seen yesterday, again, the uh, ex other examples using the web, uh, Reactive Web Framework. So they benefit from all the annotations and the auto-wiring that uh, Spring provides. So here you have a sender and uh, the method which actually does the send. So it's sending records which come in as uh, the JSON records consistent with the confluent REST proxy in order to make the comparison fair. So there's re JSON records containing binary data that is encoded, a base 64 encoded binary data, and the response going out is also JSON. So you got a flux of records coming in and a flux of responses going out. That's the actual sender, again, with the uh, auto-wiring. And that's the send. So you've got a, a stream of records coming in, and they are uh, converted into a flux, and each entry is uh, sent to Kafka using a Kafka center. And the responses using a concat map are sent as a flux back. So we'll take a look at what happens when we run this code. So we want to start a web. Spring Reactive Web. So that, so that started the uh, that started the application. So I'll start a new. I'll start the consumer. And because it's an HTTP proxy, I can just use curl to run. To send commands to it. So this is what the JSON looks like, the JSON that gets sent to the web proxy. So it's a collection of records. It's, in JSON. it's an array of records. Each of them has a value, which is basic super encoded by Tarray. You can use curl. You do a post to, uh, with the data in order to send the message. And as you can see, the Kafka consumer, which was listening, listening on it, has received the message. And you get the response back.
So we did a performance test of this using Apache Bench, varying the concurrency. So the x-axis is concurrency. And you can see uh, higher is better because it's throughput. And you can see that at the, at, with one thread, we want to do the baseline comparison at, with one thread because the stacks are different. And the uh, um, Kafka REST proxy from Confluent uses uh, a JAXRS stack with, uh, with a REST API. But you can see that at one thread, the performance is actually very, very similar. So they are comparable. But as you increase the number of threads, you can see that the throughput for reactive is significantly better than the throughput for non-reactive. It does taper off afterwards because there's an unlimited number of threads and it's running, uh, and that is adding a lot of load. But you can see that the performance across the board is better with reactive when you increase concurrency. You can also see that the CPU usage is, uh, is higher with reactive, so uh, reactive is able to use this, uh, have better CPU utilization in order to increase the throughput. That is the latency, again, 50th percentile and 75th per percentile. At, the low uh, at low concurrencies, you can see that the latency is very similar, but at higher concurrency, even though reactive is, work is using much higher, uh, is working with much higher throughputs, the latency is much lower for reactive. So lower is better here because it's latency. So this is an example where um, when you have multiple um, asynchronous um, as, as a pipeline where there are multiple entities, then re reactive does work a lot better than non-reactive. As a final example, we'll take a look at, uh, 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 this is an ETL pipeline. So you have Kafka, but you also have other um, uh, remote systems, uh, systems with remote access in your pipeline. So I've got data going from MongoDB to uh, Elasticsearch, but the data being st stored from MongoDB to broker, uh, to a Kafka and from Kafka to Elasticsearch. And this can be done quite easily in Kafka Connect. But if you had complex transformations where you, have, you want to have asynchronous uh, uh, operations within your transformation, then reactive stuff would, uh, rea the reactive code will be quite useful. So uh, you're receiving code from uh, Kafka and it's storing it into Elasticsearch, but when you're, doing, when you're doing that, when you get your first subscribe, you want to load the data from MongoDB into Kafka as well. So the data from... Um, MongoDB goes to Kafka, data from Kafka is transformed and then sent to Elasticsearch. Now all of the operators of Project Reactor are available to you, so in this case I want to batch the data before it goes to Elasticsearch. You can see that the code is quite concise and it also benefits from the operators of Project Reactor. Here's one of the examples where because of composition you get much neater code. So you got your extract, transform and load all in one, uh, all in one place and you can have requests which go up and um, events which flow down. A slightly different example of the same thing which using composition is when you're building a pipeline which unlike which rather than separate out the source side and the sync side you have data flowing through the entire pipeline so you have data loaded from MongoDB into Kafka you want to do some transformation which in, involves, for instance, getting some extra data from a, a different data source where you have a remote operation and then you want to store the, the combination into Elasticsearch. You can see that here, you, the composability of the, the APIs, the, the new operators that Project Reactor provides, they all add value. You've got end-to-end -end, uh, non-blocking um, back pressure, but you also have, even if you were using Kafka, you, hear, you benefit from the fact that the code is neater and you have, uh, uh, and you also have um, the, um, uh, all of the operators from the reactive code available to you. This is where you actually really see Kafka, reactive Kafka come into its own, and this is the value proposition for reactive Kafka. Re will, sorry, the question is, will Reactive Kafka work with Spark? So we haven't done any uh, work to integrate it with anything else. We've just done the initial testing with Reactive Kafka on its own. So um, to summarize, we looked at Apache Kafka. It is very useful for uh, if you're running applications on the cloud. It is uh, highly available distributed, and the fact that it's got low latency makes it quite useful for building microservices. We looked at a vast ecosystem of clients and tools which work well without back pressure. 
We looked at reactive streams with a func new functional style API with non blocking back pressure, which is very useful for building microservices. And we looked at reactive Kafka, br which brings the power of these two together. It, you get the full functionality of non-reactive clients with uh, the reactive API. If you're just using single-threaded code, then you, will, you may see a performance drop, and it might not be worth using, uh, switching to reactive. But when you're building a reactive pipeline which contains Kafka as well as other non-Kafka components, you really do benefit from a non-blocking back pressure. You see better concurrency and more efficient use of resources. So if you go back to the picture that we had with all these clients, the question that we are trying to answer is, if when there are so many different clients and tools, is there a place for reactive Kafka? And I think the, the, our, our studies show that there is indeed a place for reactive Kafka. It doesn't replace any of the existing tools, it is, but it does provide value when you're building an end-to-end -end service which has a, a, an end-to-end -end flow which has multiple asynchronous components, multiple remote um, uh, access where you want to use asynchronous operations and you benefit from end-to-end -end black pressure and with the side effect free composable functional API, reactive Kafka, reactive Kafka brings the full power and beauty of uh, reactive um, project reactor to the world of Apache Kafka. If you'd like to find out more, there is more on documentation. The, the, the Apache Kafka documentation is quite good. There's also lots of blogs on how to use Kafka and how to set up Kafka. There, um, for Project Reactor, please do watch the videos if you haven't seen the presentations from yesterday. And for React, the Project Reactor, and Reactive Kafka is available on GitHub. Those are the uh, some of the related sessions from yesterday. Thank you for listening. Do we have any questions? So the question is, is there any uh, proposal to do native reactive in the Kafka project itself? So we are planning to ask the Kafka community if they would be interested in taking this code, so, but we haven't done that yet. Is the reactive Kafka ready for use? So the question is, is the reactive Kafka ready for use? It's at the moment, it is available on GitHub, you can take it and play with it, but we haven't announced the release dates yet. So the question is, uh, if, if you're using a parallel flux, how does the uh, single-threaded consumer and the long poles work? So the scheduler that is used for uh, communicating with Kafka, which is the consumer flux, that is a single-threaded flux. It's a single-threaded scheduler. So there's a separate scheduler to communicate with Kafka and a parallel flux to deliver data to you. So the parallel flux is used for you to, uh, it's, you get your data and you can do your processing using that parallel flux. So the question is, when you're using thread pools to do uh, consuming, what would be the impact be if you're using reactive? So y you can have a thread pool. So with the parallel flux, you could have a re the reactor take care of your thread pool for you. So you can specify, uh, because you can override the scheduler, the default scheduler that is used. So you could use, let the reactor take care of the pooling for you. Do you mean documentation? So the, okay, so the question is, is there a visualization tool which gives you access, to, which lets you visualize the various offsets that are stored in Kafka? 
So I, I don't think at the moment you can see the offsets, which are st uh, but you can read the top. It is a standard Kafka topic, so if you want, you could consume from the topic in order to take a look at it. But I don't think there's a graphics tool, a graphical tool to do that. So uh, the question is, what is the value proposition for reactive Kafka? So if you're interested in raw throughput and you just want to send messages using a single thread like you would do with streams, where you want to uh, take data from Kafka, do some processing, and send back to Kafka, then there is, uh, you might as well use the Kafka streams. The real, rea uh, the real value proposition for uh, reactive Kafka is when you're building a heterogeneous pipeline where Kafka is one of the components. So you benefit from end-to-end -end back pressure, which is non-blocking. You have better utilization of resources. It's not a single thread that you want to just send data. You want to send a large amount of requests and uh, have them process concurrently. And that is the real value of reactive Kafka. Thank you all. I think we are run out of time now.